Welcome. <coughs> oh, I did do my la di da di da 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 this morning. So I'm doing it now, now, now. I'm doing my la di da di da right now. Welcome to another edition of 15 Minutes of Flame. That's so much better. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this here. Uh huh. There we go. And let's do that. Let's get my settings together. Get my settings together. Okay. What's happening out there, America, the world? Because I know that there are people from other parts of the world that actually do listen to this. All. 500 of you, whoever you are, God bless you. I love you. You give my life purpose and meaning in ways that you don't know. Or maybe you do. I don't know. But thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Before I get into the <clears throat> digestion of the news of the day and give it back to you in ways in which you can hopefully make sense as to what's going on, I want to talk about something quite mundane. By the way, I, I got a haircut yesterday. That's mundane, but I got a haircut, and I, I went to this place called Birds. It's a an Austin establishment, and the the haircutters, the the follicle practitioners, um, tend to be how should I say this? <clears throat> rather dramatic. It's like birds encourages a, a type of individuality that is um, very, uh, how do I say, that? Uh, endemic to Austin. The phrase here is keep Austin weird and birds is doing its very best to live up to that motto. But as long as I get a good haircut, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay with weird. I've been weird most of my life, but... And maybe now I'm a little less weird now. I can still get into the weird, but uh, it's not from a physical perspective. That doesn't interest me so much. I'm more into the weird, kind of behind the veil weird. Like the world is weird, the universe is weird and strange and different and unusual and um, perhaps even dark at times. I'm okay with that. But I don't have to have the physical manifestation of it. And maybe, and I'm just, again, I get into these kinds of <clears throat> riffs. And maybe what these people are doing is that they're personifying the strangeness of the physical world or the metaphysical world through their appearance. And that it's all kind of outward and on the skin, literally on the skin. And if you talk to them, they probably wouldn't go into the weird places that I would go. <laughs> so it's just a notice, just a thought. I went and I got a haircut and uh, and I came out kind of looking like a you know, 50 year old metrosexual, which I really didn't want. You know, it's I've got a I've got a kind of a funny haircut now. And I have to wait till it grows out again. Or either that or <clears throat> go to some other place and have it grow shorter. You know, you, you, ever, you ever get, go to a place and you, 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 you get your hair cut and you kind of mess with it and you mess with it and you mess with it and you go, eh, 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 I don't know. That's what happened yesterday at Birds. I think it's back to uh, whoever's down at Supercuts next. When I lived in California, the best haircut I ever had was in Berkeley. Fantastic. But, alas, I'm not there any longer. Oh, then I went on a run of the Chinese ladies. The Chinese haircutters. They had, they had the salon on them in Albany. They were, they were pretty good. I like talking to them. They were funny. I cracked jokes with them. All right, here we go. The mundane part. Here comes the mundane part. I watched the NC2A finals last night. I hacked into the game. I found it on the internet because I don't have CBS anymore. I 
jacked it into my TV and I felt proud of myself. I was getting around the system. I didn't have to go out to a sports bar and hang out with people that I didn't really care to hang out with at times, although maybe sometimes it's okay, and spend $25 in drinks just to watch a game. And I'm glad I didn't because it sucked. And let me tell you why it sucked. The first quarter or first half of the first half was really good. And Gonzaga was kicking ass. And I'm like, there's no way North Carolina can hang with these guys. And then guess what happened? The refs got involved. And they started calling foul after foul. And it was kind of even. I mean, North Carolina had their big man kind of get to get to three. Both of uh, Gonzaga's big men were got to three very quickly. Five fouls, you're out. Um, but when you get to three fouls, you, you play a lot more cautiously. And then the fouls started getting distributed, not just in the big men, but other players, and it stopped the play, and it stopped the play. I mean, it, it just became unwatchable. And then eventually, one of Gonzaga's best players, a young man by the name of Zach Collins, fouled out. He was a difference maker. And nobody from North Carolina fouled out. Like, they got their big guy to four. He stayed there for a while. In fact, he stayed there for the rest of the game once he got to four. It was it was a travesty of a game. And it was one of those events that <clears throat> can turn you off to sports. And a lot of people say sports. Who cares? A bunch of bullshit. It was kind of like a Super Bowl. And the big games are rigged. And this one, I believe was no different in North Carolina had to win you know, Gonzaga kind of made it close a little bit but clearly if they had allowed but both Gonzaga's big men and some of those fouls were quite dubious by the way to do their thing the game's not that close I think Gonzaga beats them by 10 it was rather unfulfilling as a spectator because I just want to watch a good game and if North Carolina, I mean, I've got no skin in it. Would I want Gonzaga to win? Kind of, yeah, because they're a small school. North Carolina is a perennial power in basketball. They're under NC2A investigation for you know, bringing their kids through school, through their, their, their programs in school. And, uh, you know, basically massaging them, not going to class. This is, I mean, it's typical bullshit. This is what happens with college sports. Total scam, especially at the high level, especially with football. Another another sports related event was uh, what happened with Baylor recently. It came out that, that I mean they were base they were essentially and this is weird and I hate to you know kind of I hate to say this, but the Baylor football program was essentially promoting a rape culture. And that's what happened. They had a n number of rapes uh, through the football program on the campus. It resulted in the termination of their head football coach, Art Bryles, and Kenneth Starr. Remember Kenneth Starr? He was the guy that was going after Bill Clinton way back when. Uh, he had to step down from his position. Who I think it was... A, Prevost or I don't know whatever you know the guy, the guy gets the big gets to be the big uh, uh, potentate. He had to step down, but the rapes uh, happened, and unfortunately, there has not been a lot of what we would consider justice for the for the women who get. Uh, they should have just nuked that program. They should have nuked it. Instead, they get to continue to do their thing. Okay, you know what it is, right? You know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. It's 
It's 9 11. 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 It's 9 so let's get to the meat of today's show. Now that I got the basketball stuff out of the way, which was really bo- kind of bothering me a little bit, uh, and the sports stuff, I want to talk about <clears throat> Susan Rice. If you have not been following this, let me uh, bring it to your attention. The Trump administration, Donald Trump, in general, uh, but the Trump administration has been going after the leakers and the spires. They're trying to ferret this out. And apparently, Susan Rice requested to unmask the names of the Trump transition team. Now, on the surface, you, you'd say to yourself, well, you know, it's not a big deal. They just want to know who's on the transition team. Well, why do they need to know? Why do they need to know? They're leaving. It's kind of like you've been been moving into a house. You've lived in a house for a long time, and now you're leaving that house. And the people that are coming into the house, well, you kind of know who the tenants are, but you want to know know, who their cousins are, who their friends are, who who they hang out with, who the friends hang out with. Why? It's none of your business. And to what end are they requesting this information for? So there's this underlying sense here that Susan Rice was acting on behalf of the Obama administration because they wanted to keep tabs on what Trump, his administration, and the quote-unquote conservatives are doing. This is from the Washington Times. I'm just going to read this. Susan Rice, who Newsweek once described as former President Barack Obama's right-hand woman, was at the center of unmasking Trump administration officials. A new report concludes Eli Lake, who broke the story for Bloomberg View, wrote on Monday morning, White House lawyers last month discovered that the former National Security Advisor, Susan Rice, requested the identities of U.S. persons in raw intelligence reports on dozens of occasions that connect to the Donald Trump transition and campaign, according to U.S. officials familiar with the matter. The pattern of Rice's request was discovered in a National Security Council review of the government's policy on unmasking the identities of individuals in the U.S. who are not targets of electronic eavesdropping, but whose communications are collected incidentally. Normally, those names are redacted, from summaries of monitored conversations and appear reports as something like the U.S. Person 1, the National Security Council Senior Director for Intelligence, Ezra Cohen Watnick, was conducting the review according to two U.S. officials who spoke with Bloomberg View on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to discuss it publicly. In February, Cohen Watnick discovered Rice's multiple requests to unmask U.S. persons in intelligence reports that related to Trump transition activities. He brought this to the attention of the White House General Counsel's Office, who reviewed more of Rice's requests and instructed her, uh, instructed him to, to end his own research. One U.S. official familiar with the report said they contained valuable political information on the Trump transition team, such as whom the Trump team was meeting, the views of Trump associates on foreign policy matters and plans for the incoming. That's a lot of intel. This is a bombshell uh, report, which confirms other outlets' reportings and explains why uh, House Intelligence Committee Chairman Representative Devin Nunes was acting so cagey last week. He had to go to the White House to get access to the NSC's computers and Mrs. Rice logins. Bloomberg's reporting confirms the New York Times account that Mr. Cohn Watnick took the review to the White House General Counsel and subsequently gave the information to 
Mr. Nunes, but the process isn't what matters here. It's the substance. Mr. Lake's report confirms Mr. Nunes' account that the Obama administration have collected incidental information on the Trump transition team and some of the unmasked names had nothing to do with Russia. But the requests for the unmasking came directly from Mrs. Rice or Ms. Rice, someone who is so close to Mr. Mr. Obama is startling. Here's where it gets um, interesting. There are still many unanswered questions. What were the motives of Ms. Rice for collecting this information? Were her requests granted? If so, did she share the information? Who did she share the information with? Who leaked the information that led to the unmasking and then resignation of former National Security Advisor Lieutenant General Michael Flynn? Was this information requested and shared before or after Mr. Trump won the White House? Where Ms. Rice requests were... This is a terribly written piece. Were Ms. Rice's requests illegal? Why or why not? Okay. In spite of the crappy writing that I had to edit in my head and proofread in my head as I was writing this, it's kind of a big deal. Because it indicates that there is a level of intelligence seeking, scraping, that the Obama administration was doing as Trump came into the office. Now, if you're a, a friend of Obama, you're a pal of Obama, and you like Obama and the administration, you don't like Trump, you're a champion. It's like, yeah, let's get as much on him as we can. Let's take that motherfucker down. Down. So you don't really have, it's, it's kind of like, you don't care anymore. See, this is what's happened in sort of, sort of politics in the world. And people, I know, it, especially people that listen to what I do here 30 minutes a day, they, they don't really care about politics as much. You know, what they're really into is they're really into the truth and really into consciousness and they're into uh, kind of protecting their sacred rights as sovereign beings. I totally get that. We're navigating through this jungle, this disinformation jungle, and there are some relative standards involved. You see, nobody cares anymore about the standards they're gone. They're done. This is this is kind of the biggest thing that we have to wrap our heads around. There's no there's no sense of of kind of right or wrong anymore. There's no sense of justice and injustice unless the injustice is done to somebody who feels as though they've been wronged. In which case they will jump on the justice train as quickly as possible. But if there's injustice done to another person and their injustice doesn't relate or equate with the other person's sense of injustice, well, they just don't give a shit. And in fact, they might even partake in some, you know, hardy schadenfreuden, which is, you know, experiencing some, some joy at somebody else's loss or pain or pathos. It happens. This is where we are. I mean, it's, there's, no, there's no standards anymore. I mean, it kind of went away 9-11. Really, if you want to go back... It, because 9-11 is the biggest, it's one of, I mean, the three biggest lies of the 20th century, really. I mean, let's say from 1960 on, lie number one, what happened to JFK? Of course, we know he was assassinated. It wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald, sorry. And if you dig down, dig down deep enough, far enough to figure out who it was. It's kind of a compendium of people, compendium of groups, but there were three groups clearly involved. One was the deep state, one was Israel, and um, the other was the mob, and they all kind of colluded and made it all happen. The mob piece comes later with uh, with uh, Jacob Rubenstein, also known as Jack Ruby, who owned a, uh, a mob club in Dallas. But it was a lie. That was the first... Big lie. I mean, there are other lies. World War II was a lie. Getting us into the war with Japan was a lie. Pearl Harbor was a lie. The way the Depression went was a lie. Uh, the uh, getting everybody on board with federal taxes that was a lie. To oh, don't worry about it. small, small little pittance. So the 20th century is built on lies. I mean, come on now. Why we're in Vietnam, that was a lie. But the three big lies 
from 1960 onward are Death of JFK, 1, Moon Landing, 2, and 9-11, 3. Those are the big lies. And with with 9-11, and then ultimately what happened with the financial crisis, another lie, a big one, there was never a sense of justice. There was never a sense of closure. There was never a sense that we really got to the truth. Because we didn't. You know, we rounded up a bunch of bunch of people who might have been guilty of some kind of miscarriage of quote unquote justice as a member of Al Qaeda or the Taliban, whom by the way we created and then stuck them down in Guantanamo and turned them into basically rabid dogs and probably ferreting them back out into society. <laughs> probably getting the best uh, the best training there is down in Guantanamo. I don't know, I'm speculating here. But there's no sense of justice. You're going into Iraq and finding whoever that was, if it was Saddam Hussein or some weird double, that was no sense of justice. Finding the poor copy of Osama bin Laden who'd been dead for at least seven, seven or eight years, that was no sense of justice. None. And look what happened in 2009. People lost their homes. They lost their lives. They lost their livelihood with this financial crash, which was horrific. And there is no, there was not one single person who was involved in aiding and abetting that crash with maybe the exception of Bertie Madoff, but it's, it's kind of apples and oranges with him, right? It's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different crime. But nobody ever, nobody ever came to justice. You know, they brought um, Ben Bernanke in front of Congress. Tim Geithner, where's the money? I don't know. Do you know where it went? No, I don't know where it went. Do you know how much? No, I'm sorry. I mean, just, I mean, this is what they got away with. And they sat there for probably about uh, two hours, maybe three hours, ate a bunch of shit. And then they went on with their lives and snickered and laughed and you know, got away with it. So there's never any closure with any of these massive crimes against humanity. Whether they're crimes of consciousness or economic crimes. And so what happens now is that there's no sense of justice. But when Nixon recorded a few people, boy, oh boy, oh boy. They're singing a different tune, man. They 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 were ready to tie his hands together and pull him through town, pull him through the streets of D.C. in a pickup truck. But there's there's no sense of justice, and so what happens now is that people they don't they don't really care as long as they get or their group gets whatever they want or need, screw everybody else. So in this case, bringing it back to Susan Rice, there's, there's, a, there's a sense here where, where probably there are groups around the country that are very supportive of what she did. It's an act of treason. But I think we're living under the illusion that this is the United States of 40 years ago. It's not. It's not even close. And I'm not sure what it is anymore. It is a, a kind of a fractured uh, nation of semi-balkanized states. Like clearly, California is a balkanized state. Oregon or the, or the, uh, the People's Republic of Portland is a balkanized state. And this is where the cities are, are going. This is what the cities are turning into. Big cities are going to become sort of these uh, states unto themselves. And that's because they're being uh, powered and ruled by the UN and Agenda 2030. It's happening right before your very eyes. So this whole notion of America is um, evaporating. It's going away. So when we have something like what will happen to Susan Rice? Let's speculate here. Let's get into this. I think she's a Scorpio, by the way. What will happen to her? 
I'm willing to bet nothing. I'm willing to bet that um, the most that uh, she will do might be come before some special committee, answer some questions, stonewall, you know, do the dance. Maybe she'll get um, laser beamed by Trey Gowdy, which would be fun to watch. I mean, Trey, Trey Gowdy is great to watch. He's fantastic. This guy, this guy's a, he's, he's, he's a, he's, he's, he's a steel trap. He's, you know, he's amazing. But whatever comes of it, you get a sense, a little bit of a sense of justice, right? Oh, look at that. Oh, he got her. He got her. He got him. Look what he did to Comey. But what happens? Nothing ever happens. So we get this kind of vague sense of mm, justice to some degree in the moment. And then after that, everybody sort of puts their masks back on and gets right back into the uh, the play. Rejoins the movie. Nothing ever happens. Well, at some point, if we want to change what's going on, and I think some people do want to change what's going on, something is going to have to happen. Somebody is going to have to take a very hard fall. But I'm not sure Trump has the stomach for it. I think Trump likes to talk a big game. He likes to rattle sabers. But I don't think he has the stomach for any kind of litigation. Because he's got skeletons. He's got significant skeletons. But at the very least, you know, he's interesting still. I talked about this yesterday. John McCain, he got his... uh, you know, his underwear all tied up, you know, or he, he was just, he's just like apoplectic about Tillerson saying, well, we're not going to go after Assad. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting kind of reversal from Trump. And we're going to get this all the time. And I talked about this on yesterday's show. We're going to, we're going to get it all the time with him. There'll be things that you're going to like and things that you're not going to like. Things will be interesting, things you want to just hold your nose. And that's the way it is. But but I'm going to relate a bit of a story here, a brief story. And uh, tomorrow we're going to get into some, some heavier material. But I was watching a, a video of Louis Farrakhan. And I think, again, Farrakhan's one of the great orators of the 20th century. He's a very sharp man. Very, very sharp, very crafty, and now apparently NOY is connected to Scientology, which is interesting. So he was talking about Trump, and he was talking about sort of the collapse of politics in Washington, D.C. And he he essentially said that when this happens, leadership is over. There's a breakdown in leadership. And he was intimating to his audience who I'm, I would say is probably about 95% African-American. And he said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, oh, yeah, I think you're all saying, well, it'll, I'll step back and, uh, you know, I'll sort it, we'll, we'll see, we'll uh, let it sort itself out. I'll let it sort itself out. And what, what, what uh, Farrakhan was intimating was that the system was ripe for collapse. And that he was planting the seed inside of his congregation that they should not be passive, that they should be actively joining in and accelerating and facilitating the collapse. And I thought it was a very interesting comment for a number of reasons, because the sharks are in the water and they are smelling blood. And it's quite real. But we elected, theoretically, Trump, or the people elected Trump, on a number of different planks in his platform and his mandates. But ultimately, what I saw in Trump was somebody who was a disruptor, and you all know that. And that's what, exactly what he's been. He's been very disruptive. 
And the rest is kind of up to us. The rest is up to us. And what are we going to do? Are you going to sit back and let it sort itself out? Or are you going to get involved and on some level be a change agent for the things that we feel are really important to our lives? Clean food, clean water, clean air, 5G breakdown of our cellular structure, all the stuff that we know in our hearts that are hacking this planet and hacking the world. What's interesting, and I I could be completely wrong, but I feel like that there are groups with their self-interests that are not willing to listen to other groups and their self-interest. Although I will say, I will say that... uh, uh, there's a, a woman over on Facebook named Greer, wh- whom I was really, really close with a few years ago. And we've, we've sort of fallen out of touch. We used to connect all the time. And um, she's really strong into the African-American astrological community. And she's always bringing up my broadcasts that were connected to smart meters that I was doing back around uh, 2011. So there is some awareness in other groups around chemtrails and smart meters and EMFs and the 5G network and genetically modified foods. But it's not enough. It's not enough. It could be more. So I'll pose that to you. What are you going to do? And how are you going to ride this wave of change? this accelerated wave of change in your own life because there's energy in chaos, believe it or not. All right, um, why don't we leave it there for today and I'll be back tomorrow. We're going to get into something a little bit heavier tomorrow. And I'm going to get into Albert Pike's vision of World War III and I'm going to give you an update as to where we are on that scale in moving towards World War III. So hang on to your hat. See me here again 24 hours from today for 15 minutes of flame. Use your head to discern what's real. Your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. Take good care.